Okay, welcome everybody. This is CSIS 3020 Web Programming and Design. This is week six. Let me see. Yep. You guys are supposed to turn in by this Sunday your JavaScript menus, a fourth page. Hopefully a relevant page and a wiki domain model. Some of you have asked me, how do you create the domain model? What tool do you use? How do you put it in the wiki like you did? So that's one of the first things that we're going to cover in tonight, so you guys will be prepared. Uh, it's not that difficult, to be honest with you. <coughs> so you have to create a wiki page called the domain model. And you got to put in there a snapshot of the UML diagram. In the UML diagram, you, you guys will use whatever it's convenient for you. Paint, Visio, uh, Violet, Argo UML. The tool that I'm going to be using tonight is going to be Violet. Okay? <coughs> and it should be a diagram that depicts your website entities and their relationship. So let's take a look at how I did mine. If you go to my wiki, you will see that there is a domain model page. When you click on it, you will find that I have made a copy of my entities from home page, right? Just so I know exactly that I'm putting all the entities that I'm supposed to. It's just a copy of the one that I that I had from my problem statement now, and see if you guys remember. And I have gone through several versions of it. Okay? In fact, this is the one that I created using Violet. So if you guys see, I have timesheet, employee, department, status, time, time and hours, for, even though they're two different nouns, to me they mean the same, time and hours. Reminder and notifications, I also have those two nouns in my problem statement, reminders and notifications. To me, that's the same thing. Precedent, week, company, human resources, and payment. Okay. After analyzing what is it that I am building, you know, going through timesheet list, going through the registration, going through the login, and my fourth page, which is enter hours, entering timesheet hours, I have decided that timesheet is definitely the most important entity in my system. And I need you guys to identify who is your most important entity in your system? That's going to be key, okay? Because among the ten functional requirements that you have to implement, you will have to do the creates, the reads, the updates, and the deletes. What it's typically called the CRUDs: creates, reads, updates, and deletes of that main entity. Your website should be able to do that, and you will see that in mind you will see that I will be able to create timesheets, delete timesheets, update existing timesheets, and read timesheets. Okay? So that guy is definitely my most important entity. And then following employee. Employee is definitely ent an entity. It's not going to be just an attribute. I'm going to need to save so much stuff of uh, so much stuff about an employee that it's going to have to be an entity. Department as well. Department could be a, an attribute of the employee, but since it's also going to be used in timesheet, I don't want to repeat the department in in the timesheet and the department in the employee. Okay, so I want to be able to take it as a separate entity. So the department will be a separate entity. It will have a code, it will have a name, it will have a location, enough attributes to make it worth its own entity. Status, 
and that means by status I mean the timesheet status that's definitely an attribute just an attribute of timesheet okay so it should not be higher to to a, a, an entity level it's just an attribute of the timesheet time and hours same thing it's just attributes of the timesheet reminder notifications same thing it's going to be an attribute either of the timesheet or the employees I have not decided that yet okay precedent precedent is just one of the employees okay so somehow under my employee entity I'm going to have to be able to differentiate between an hourly rate employee an exempt employee a manager a precedent a human resources or payroll somehow all of those guys are employees but I'm gonna have to have an entity I'm sorry not an entity an attribute in employee that would allow me to differentiate between all of them okay and you guys are gonna see that it's gonna be an attribute called the role employee role or employee type something like that, of that nature week week is gonna be also an attribute of the timesheet it's not worth going into details as weak as a different entity because weak is just really if you think about it when I mentioned weak in the problem statement I was talking about the period ending week or period ending date of a week so that should be just an attribute of a timesheet company I'm not going to use company for anything really human resources again I mentioned human resources because there's going to be an employee from human resources so it, it's in in the sense of human resources will also be an employee type either either a department or an employee type that works at human resource and payment payment definitely as an entity because payment will have a timesheet associated to and would also have dollars taxes uh, rates a whole bunch of stuff attributes big enough to make it its own entity so initially the first shot that I gave it at for my domain model looked like this and this is what a domain model is okay every main entity will be put inside a square or a, or a rectangle okay and when there is a relationship with another square or another rectangle which is another entity then you put an arrow and this is how you read the arrows okay the arrows will have numbers or labels one employee manages zero or more timesheets the arrow is a verb okay it's an action this guy does something to this other guy and there's a cardinality on both ends of the relationship okay and the UML diagram is nothing else than that it's just trying to depict your entities and their relationships in your system so literally after you create your domain model I should be able to look at it and know exactly what you're building you guys have, have heard the expression that a picture is worth a lot more than a thousand words right this is an example of such a picture okay so one employee manages zero or more timesheets or has or creates okay it's an action creating updating in general managing so an employee manages zero more timesheets now what's the reason that that's the relationship between timesheet and, 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 and employee yeah because if there's a timesheet every week guess what there's gonna be a lot of them okay unless the employee is a really bad employee and it couldn't even last a week okay 
but in that case the zero is in there so a new employee that just came in could exist in the system as an employee but might not have any timesheets whatsoever yet why because he or she has not charged any timesheets yet that's why this zero is there okay new employees will have zero timesheets this is stuff that you got to discuss, you got to think about in order to make sure that you're put in the right relationships and with the li right card cardinalities. What about the relationship between type sheet and statuses? Let's do not read what the diagram says. Let's think about my system. How many s different statuses can a time sheet have at one point in time? Can a, can a timesheet be pending and submitted at the same time? Can it be uh, paid and submitted? No. It can only be one status at a time. So every timesheet will have only one status. Is it pending? Okay, it's pending. Then the employee finished inputting all the information, submitted, and now it's sent to my manager. Now the status is submitted. It's no longer pending. Now it's submitted. So, how do you depict that? Like this. One status will be assigned to zero or more timesheets. That's going from the bottom to the top direction. Right? Or going from top to down, zero or more timesheets will have one status. One and only one status. That's a good question. Um, in this case, because the status is going to be an attribute of the timesheet, and this is something that I have, I was vaguely about when I did the first version of the of the of the uh, mo domain model, but now I'm totally sure on the second version, I'm totally sure that status is just an attribute of the timesheet. Okay. Then, what's the relationship between timesheet and actual time, or hours? Well, a timesheet contains zero or more hours. In fact, if we want to be very exact about it, one timesheet contains seven hours. One for Monday, one for Tuesday, one th 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 all the way to Sunday. Okay? So a timesheet has to have time for Monday, time for Tuesday, time for all those. So if we want to be exact, one timesheet contains seven times. Or seven hours, or whatever you want to call it. Okay? Now, what about the department? Now, keep in mind, we could have made it really complex in the sense that an employee could work two out of the five days of the week for one department and the other three for another department. We, didn't we did not want to build something as complicated as that. We're going to assume that the entire week will be charged to only one department. And that's an assumption that I put in my problem statement. You guys remember just to make the scope smaller, okay, and the system not so complicated. So that means that all the time, all seven times, or zero too many, as I, I say indicate here, is charged to only one department. Okay? So the entire week will be charged to only one department. In my second version, when I noticed that, you know what, yeah, status is just a natural of the timesheet. It doesn't have to be that complicated. That's when I decided, okay, timesheet should have an ID that identifies it, should have a status that tells me what's the status of it, and it will have hours, one for each Monday through Sunday, and then the week. Is it the first week? or is it January 7th, the end of the week, or, you know, the second week, whatever, okay? We haven't decided that yet. 
What about? Oh, and I'm missing payment here. I identify payment as a, as an as a, as an entity later on in the second version. So let's talk about payment. A payment is for one timesheet and only one timesheet. Okay, so all the employees will get paid on a weekly basis. That means that the relationship between timesheet and payment will be a one-to-one. -one. For this timesheet, there will be only one payment. And the payment will have its own ID, a regular rate, okay, say $20 an hour, overtime rate, which is typically one and a half, okay, and we're gonna, and that's a business rule that we can decide or human resources can decide later on. So the overwrite the overtime rate will be in 100, 150% over the regular rate. There's a tax percent, okay, and then a net pay. Those are the attributes of a payment, okay. What about the employee? Well, I, I need to be able to identify every employee. So every employee will have an ID, will have a name, will have an email. Remember, you, as an employee, you're getting a notification. Hey! You gotta do your timesheet. It's Friday two o'clock. Friday three o'clock. You better do your timesheet. If you do your timesheet and you submit it, your manager will get an email. Hey, your employee just submitted the timesheet. Approve it or disapprove it. Okay? So email is important. Type. Type of employee. Am I an hourly rate? Am I a manager? Am I the president? Am I a CIO? Am I human resources? Am I who am I? What type of employee am I? And depending on the type of employee, when I log in into the system, I will get different content. Remember, you guys are creating websites that will produce different content depending on who is logged in. Okay? Some people will have a lot more rights to your website and some people will have a lot less. Password. You gotta know the password. Right? And later on, we're going to see that the password is not clear text. It will actually be encrypted, and nobody can figure out what's c the password, okay? Because it's encrypted. And the pay rate. So, those are important things about the employee. What about the department? The department is very important the ID, you know, and a name. Later on, I identify, you know, what else is important? If we have a. a, a, a a very distributed company, the location. So the department should have also a location. So I added later on a location. So in the third version, look at this third version. This third version is an entity relationship diagram. So we walked away from a UML diagram into an entity relationship diagram. This is a diagram that you get way after you have included your entire and UML into a database. Okay? And that's exactly what I want you guys to do for two weeks from today. Two weeks from today, or that Sunday, you guys are going to have to turn in a database. Very small database. In my case, one, two, three, four tables. Each table with those fields. Okay, and I need 10 records. That's it, 10 records. You make them up. Employee one, Jane Smith, uh, password whatever. Yes, yes, 10 records per table. So in my case, and I'm gonna be sharing with you a week from today, the database that I created for Timex. Question, Stefan. Oh, that's a good question. Yes. In fact, there is a relationship. The question was, how come you have payment related to uh, timesheet and not to employee since payment has the pay rate which is associated to the employee? The answer is yes. Employee and payment are related. And they are related by the timesheet itself. So it's a transitive 
relationship if you if you so it's not a direct relationship but it's a trans transcendent relationship through the timesheet so the employee um, has this timesheet right and the relationship between them is that timesheet has an employee ID and and we're starting now to get into the database management territory, right? So for those of you who have not seen databases, then I need you to review it. Very, I, I'm just going to do the general uh, review of it. Uh, but if you guys don't remember how to do this, I need you to review it. Okay. Basically, t an employee has an ID. That's what it's called a primary key. So it has to be unique. You and I, as employees of this company, cannot have the same ID. Okay? And it can be SSN. It could be a, genera a company-generated number. It could be whatever. Okay? But it has to be unique. And I'm going to call it ID. And in this case, I'm just going to be simple as possible. Play one, two, three, all the way to whatever. Okay? Now... How do I know what are the timesheets for employee ID 1? Well, you put the employee ID as an attribute of the timesheet. And that employee ID becomes what it's called a foreign key. Because ID in employee is a key. Employee ID attribute or field in timesheet will be a foreign key. And it should have the same value. So all my timesheets, all my timesheets, if I'm employee ID 1, all my timesheets should have as employee ID a 1 value. Okay? And that's how I'm going to be able to get all my timesheets. <coughs> same kind of deal with the relationship between timesheet and payment. Since timesheets have an ID, so I'm employee ID 1, and I have timesheet ID 3, 17, 20, 35, and 50. And those are my timesheets, okay? Well, those IDs will be foreign keys in the payments. So if you guys see, timesheet ID is an attribute of a payment. So there is going to be a payment with timesheet ID 3 that belongs to me. And there's going to be another payment with timesheet ID 50 which belongs to me. And there's going to be one and only one. Okay? And payments will also have their own primary keys, but we don't really use that for for anything, right? Same kind of deal with the department. The department will have a key called department code, okay? And guess what? Timesheet will have a department code. So the department code field in timesheet is a foreign key to the department code key in department table. Okay? So remember, the relationships that initially started in a UML diagram as just arrows, right? Depicting an action between two entities. That gets implemented in the database as a primary key that goes as a foreign key in another table. And that's what I need you guys to build two weeks from today. That's why it's so important that you build your UML diagram correctly. Now, what tool do I use to do that? All right. Okay. So, let's move on. I have shared with you guys somewhere in here under software. Yep. Violet software. Okay? You click on it and it will download a jar. 
Okay. Put it anywhere you want it. I'm going to put it in my desktop. Okay. And as long as you have Java, the runtime install, you can just take that jar and double click on it. You guys probably have done this in another class. If you haven't, then you will be doing it in another class. I'm sure. This is it. This is Violet. Okay? It's a Java standalone application. You can create use case diagrams, class diagrams, object diagrams, state diagrams. This is all part of the object oriented design methodology. Okay? We're not going to cover anything but the UML on that. This in itself is a whole course. So it doesn't make sense to cover all that stuff. All you need from here is to be able to build a class diagram. So when you click on class diagram, you will be able to get this empty canvas, okay? And you just start putting classes. So this class is called employee. And this class is called timesheet. Okay, and you can go as deep as attributes and methods and all that stuff. For your first version, I just need you to depict your entities and the relationships. Okay. So when there is a depends on, you just grab the one to the next and you say, okay, this is it. Okay. The start label is one employee. The middle label is managers and the end label is zero dot dot star meaning zero or more once you create your entire UML diagram you save it as a JPEG and that's what you upload to your wiki any questions? you could probably do the same thing second. Save. I want to make sure that I'm not lying to you. Export. I'm sorry. It's export. Export. It's an image file. So let's say UML. So this is the file that I created in Violet. It's called UML. It's a class diagram. <coughs> and what? Where is UML? The image. UML the image. Okay, let's try this again. File export to image file UML PNG. Oh, okay, it's a PNG. Save. Exit. Do you guys see a UML PNG? Oh, here it is. So if I open it, uh, I think I, I think my PNGs are associated to the Windows picture and fax viewer, and this is it. Yeah, the 
little bit ugly. Okay. Is that the only tool? No, there's another tool called Argo UML. And there's another tool called Paint. If you want to do it in Paint or whatever. Argo UML. I think this is one of those open source, you know, just like Pilot from Tigris. Okay, you can download it. It is going to be also, um, I don't know, last time that I checked, I think it was an installation. I'm not sure. You double click on it. Argo UML. I think the version that I have is 0 0.34. They're probably higher than that by now. Same kind of deal. See this? Class. Employee. Another class. Timesheet. See this? association between this guy and this guy and the association has different this is a uh, one employee has zero dot dot star for many and manages got it that's just another tool. Pick your poison. At the end of the day, you guys have to create a domain model like I did here. Okay? You guys probably don't have to go through three versions. You can go from from the UML version to the entity relationship version. All right. Any questions about domain model, UML diagram? What is it about? Building this diagram is going to allow you, first of all, to think again very clearly in detail what is it you're building. Second, from this diagram, jumping into the database is going to be almost immediate, easy. Okay? Because most probably one to one, every entity is going to be a table in your database. And you have already identified what are the attributes, and each attribute is going to be a field in the tables. So that's the reason why we're doing that. And in fact, that's an industry standard.